And the node classification, again, uh, I need, I use the CARA citation network data, right? So I, I can I load the data again. Uh, and since there are only one graph in this data set, so I can just access it by index zero. And that is basically that one graph. Uh, and over here, I can print out many properties of this graph, say number of nodes, number of edges, etc. And I can even see, say, how many uh, labels belong to the training and how many labels belong to the validation and test. And what is your uh, training, uh, training node label rate? Like what's the percentage of the nodes has a training label? Etc. Right, and also it also has some uh, very good graph properties that you can directly calculate on. So it's whether it's some has some isolated nodes and whether it has some self loops. Just as a one question asked earlier, and whether this is directed or not. Right? So it will print out all this information. And what interests you most is actually they have a pretty small training nodes. <laughs> so in, in this data set, they have 500 validation nodes, 1,000 test nodes, but only have 140 training nodes. <laughs> and if you do the really just around 5%, so it's pretty small uh, training a graph with uh, pretty small training labels. Uh, but, but, but I think that this is what got the, the problem very interesting is to see that even if we just label a few, uh, you know, just a few uh, 100 graph nodes, can it still fulfill the task? Can it do a good job uh, doing the document classification? Right? So in order to do the comparison, I uh, first actually we can just build a very simple multi-layer dense uh, network. And this network hasn't used any graph structure and it mainly used that 1,400 uh, node embeddings, right? So that is the backs of words counts. So we are going just to use that, those back of word count for this classification and just see how it performs. Uh, so, if, so, so, and also uh, by doing this, we can see it. Uh, in order to build a PyTorch model, you need to inherit it, or well, majority of it. <laughs> it's good to inherit a model from the Torch NN module. So, and there are many two major functions you need to override in your customized model class. Right? So, fat one is your init function. A second is the forward function. Basically, in your forward pass, how can you generate a prediction or result uh, for your data? And your in, in your init, init function, you can say manual, you can set the C so that it's uh, you know you can recover your result. And also you, you can define what layers you want to use. And here uh, we just use say very simple two two layers network, right? So this is and uh, for the first uh, it's basically one hidden layer that will do some dimension reduction from one thousand four hundred to uh, say sixteen uh, dimensions, right? And in your second layer, basically it's your output layer where you map your dimension of sixteen the hidden channels to your number of classes, say seven. Right. So you can do this uh, double, uh, this uh, two layers, multi-layer uh, dense network. And then in your forward function, you are basically just calling your uh, layer that is uh, defined in your init function. You just call in it and pass your input in it. And you can choose, uh, as since it's, uh, we, we expect the output to be positive, so we can pass it down to a ReLU function or or even maybe sigmoid function if it fits your task better. So here I just want my output to be all positive. So I can pass it through a ReLU function. You can even pass it out through some dropout over here. Uh, you can you can uncomment this and see whether it improves or not. Uh, well, it's uh, I have tried, but I want to leave it up to you to try it out. 
And one very, very interesting uh, input for the dropout is this. Uh, you can tell whether uh, it's in training status or not. So if it is in training, it will do the dropout. And if it's not in the training period, it won't. So this is just what it means. So this this is this is already inherited variable from the NM module class. And lastly, we can pass the output from the ReLU to the second layers of the of the uh, the linear layer, right? And that gives us the final output. And the final output is actually a vector of number of classes, right? Say if we are going to predict seven classes, the output will be a vector of seven. And out of the vector of seven, uh, the highest, highest score is the predicted label for that document, right? Okay, so here is a simple, very uh, naive model for the document classification. And we can initialize the hidden channels to be 16, which is the, so, and if you print the model out, you will see exactly, you know, uh, which dimension it's going to map, right? So in the beginning, it's going to map from 1,400 to 16, and then 16 to seven over here. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, once we define our model, next is how can we going to, uh, how are we going to train it, right? So uh, in order to train, you first need to, first define your loss function, right? So usually for the class classification, the default is the cross entropy loss. Uh, usually it's the one to go, uh, especially for the multi-label classification. Uh, and then you need your optimizer, right? So we can use the atom optimizer and you need to let the optimizer know what parameters the optimizer is going to solve, right? Say we can get all the unknown uh, variables in the model just by just calling this. So this is the parameter we're going to solve. And this is your learning rate and the weight decay. So usually this is a default. You can, you can it's good to just start with the default and maybe you can tune it with some other um, package of research or maybe hyper opt later on if you want to tune it. And then we can define our train uh, function over here. So uh, in your train function, so you, you will just call this model train. Uh, and, and then you need to clear out your gradients. I think this, this is just a required step. If you, if you just need the gradients from current step, you don't want any gradients accumulated from previous step, you, you'd better just uh, clear out <laughs> The gradients in your, optimize, uh, in your uh, optimizer, and then you can pass on your data to your model, and it will gives you uh, output, and then you can calculate your training loss. And of course, the training loss you need to pass on your training mask, right? So this criteria is that cross entropy loss, and of course, uh, you may also want to track your validation loss along with your training loss, so you can also calculate the validation loss here. And then once you get your training loss, you can call a backward function. So this is basically to derive the gradients uh, from your loss. And then you can call an op optimizer step that is going to update the model parameters according to the gradients calculated from here. So this is all happening underneath. So it's good that uh, PyTorch already wrapped it, wrap it up uh, for you. Uh, so usually it follows these steps uh, uh, that you can, and this function I think can be reused, right? So it can also be reused in later on, like in the gen uh, training. The only difference is the model is different. Uh, and then you can also write your test function. Uh, and, and in your test function, yeah, so you can just, calling your model and it will pre, uh, output a vector of uh, seven, right? because you have seven labels. And then you find the arc max, which is your predicted label uh, over here. And then you can calculate, for example, the task accuracy over here. Uh, and then we are going to train. 
And usually in training a neural network, you have to run many epochs, right? So here is that epochs, how many iterations, how many updates you want to update your model according to the loss. So say over here, we can run 200 times. And of course, in neural network, we usually have the early stopping according to the validation loss. But I think I will leave it up to you to, <laughs> to add that uh, if you want to add some early stopping according to this validation loss over here. And say we are going to run uh, 200 times, and you are going to see the, so this is your training loss, and this is your uh, validation loss. And you can see the validation loss is still pretty much decreasing till the end. So I guess you can run even more epochs if you want to further improve the model. Uh, so once it is done, and then you can just call the test function, uh, which will applies the trained model to your test data. And then you can finally uh, get your test accuracy, test classification accuracy. Yeah, so that is the first model uh, on the uh, multi-layer dense uh, network. Just train a simple network uh, based on the node embeddings. Till now, we haven't utilized any of the network, the graph structure or the edges itself. So all right now, we are just mainly rely on those uh, uh, back of words counts to do the document classification. So I will pause it here a little bit and to see if there's any questions and if anyone runs into any issue when you run in this. Hey, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, I think I want to ask one question about like the data. Like if the input data is, input data have nodes and edges, and then mm -hmm. usually, uh, how, how do we submit the data for training and the testing? Can you explain a little bit? Oh, usually, how can we split it? Yeah, uh, for the node classification, you need to, you can just randomly sample the nodes, right? So you can just randomly sample some nodes uh, for training. And actually, PyTorch has some uh, function already provided for you. You can just generate your train mask test mask and validation mask by, by you calling that function. I think Python Ge Geometric has that function. So it's just through some randomly sampling process. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. And actually next in the link prediction task, I will show how to randomly sample some ad, edge, edge uh, for the, uh, for, because that, that is the more kind of uh, depends on whether or not you want to use that edge as a label or not, because the edges are there, right? And that's like this, the node classification, it requires some human inputs to do the label. Maybe that's why I think they have such a smaller training data because it requires user input for the training labels, right? So, so you see that uh, with only 5% of the training labels on this graph, and this MLP gives you around 60% of that test accuracy. Yeah, and then next, we are going to see how the GNN is able to improve on this uh, based on the uh, graph structures because the cited papers or cited documents are likely related to one category, right? So, so, uh, so the, the citation relationship should indicate what should help kind of uh, transfer the labels to other nodes. Okay, any other questions on um, MLP? Okay, let's move on to GN. So first we will use uh, a baseline GN. Uh, it's a graph convolutional network. I think that's the very beginning versions of the GN layers. Uh, and again, 
what we need to change. So actually it looks pretty much very similar to the MLP. <laughs> What's the main difference is the layer is different, right? So the layer right now is not, not that linear layer, it's from the uh, torch geometric, the graph convolutional network layer. And in this layer, again, you need to just like linear layer, you need to define what's your input for your data set. So the, this is basically your node embedding dimension, right? So this is your node embedding dimension and like what is the hidden dimensions you want to map your node features to. And then here you can define two layers, G, G, uh, convolutional neural network uh, layers. Uh, and then again, just like linear layer, right? So finally you want to get a vector of number of classes. You want to get a number of seven. All here. And then in the forward class, I think this looks exactly the same, almost the same with the linear one. It's just that we right now taking the edge index, right? So in addition to X, in addition to the node embedding, Right now we taking the edge index, which is the, 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 the citation relationship between each of each document. Right. And then and then we pass it on to this layer. And on this layer, we do a ReLU function again to make sure it's positive. And then you can turn the dropout on and to test it. Uh, and then we can pass it on uh, X to another convolutional layer. And that is your final output. And again, the output is exactly the same with the previous output. It's the vector of, of length number of classes. And then you can define your models here. And of course, you can print it and to see exactly what is included in that model. Uh, and next, we can train this, right? So I think it's pretty much the same. <laughs> Uh, with the Nino one, with the MLP one, right? So you still use your atom to solve it. You, you, your uh, loss is still the cross entropy loss. And the model is defined from here, right? So the GCN models. And we even use the same number of hidden units, which is 16. Uh, and in your train, you, you will still follow exactly almost the same train function, right? I actually, I don't see any difference uh, here unless this. Right now in your model, it also requires you to input your edge index here, which is the graph structure. And again, we can output, return your training loss and the validation loss. Uh, and in your test, in your test uh, function over here, yeah, so you, the main difference is still you need to pass in your edge index and then you calculate and then you find the, the position with the highest score. And then you can calculate, calculate it on your test mask and get your test classification accuracy. Uh, and this time we can train it uh, 100 epochs, right? And, and you can see that it, it's pretty much also still decreasing. You can, you can keep increasing these epochs and to see how it works. Uh, and then finally, once it is trained, and then we can just run the test function and it will returns you the test accuracy. And if you see that it actually, well, it can go beyond 80% from 60%. So that is the, that is the 20% 20, 20 more improvement. So it's really amazing by a uh, great improvement by by including or utilizing the graph structures uh, in your task. So I think I will again pause it here a while and just feel free to ask questions or, or if you want to discuss any of this. So I think what is really amazing to me is they just use 100 something labels, training labels, and just by utilizing the graph structure and can already do, a, a, I think a good enough job <laughs> for this task. So yeah, I think that that's where I think the graphs can really help 
in this scenario, you can help transfer the labels by this link connection. Hey, Anne, just a quick mm -hmm. side comment. Uh -huh. So when we're when we're doing tabular neural networks, uh -huh. usually we process all of the training set and then we separately process the validation set. And I thought it's kind of cool here where they process everything and then they just use the mask um, <laughs> to pull out the training and they use the mask to pull out the validation. So technically speaking, when it's training, it's actually computing everything on the test nodes but then uh -huh. they're just getting all masked out so that it never uses them. So it's kind of doing extra uh, compute, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's more in, it's more uh, efficient but, because yeah. it's just one pass. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, I like you mean that this? Little, yeah, yeah. So the yeah, all like that actually that includes mask. everything, yeah. It includes the test nodes too, but they're all being ignored and there's no training happening on them because when you mask them out, there's no loss. So there's no yes. gradient signal and yeah. therefore you're not mm -hmm. you're not leaking any data on the on the test set yes but i just i just like that that code structure the rest of the training loop is a pretty standard yeah i torch training loop even if you were doing again just tabular data into a, a simple yeah. neural network yeah Thanks. so it's a small leap from structure to graph so i think the main change is you just define your layer differently I mean, just from a practical perspective, of course, to fully understand, you know, what's in the layers and how can we create even a customized layers, there's a lot more to learn. But I mean, just to simply build one is, uh, is a very small leap. You, you just need to figure out how to call in this uh, graph uh, uh, layers. And there are many different layers in graphs, which I'm going to show next another one uh, to replace this one. Um, I just have a side question, mm -hmm. not related to the algorithm. Um, do you mind scrolling up a little bit? Uh, I was just wondering for displaying the plot, um, is it using JavaScript just better for this type of plot? Or I'm just wondering, because in the past, I usually see like, like Matplot or Seaborn. So I wasn't sure is this better for geometric shape? Oh, you mean this? Yes. Yeah, I think this is related to the yeah IPython display because sometimes when you run a notebook, the if you don't increase the maximum height, maybe it will shrink. So some messages may get collapsed and shrinked. So this is one way to to kind of increase the maximum height so you can scroll all the way down, you know, without any information got compressed over there. And um, yeah, this JavaScript, I think the IPython display use the JavaScript for, for the display function. Okay, great, thank you. Mm. Okay, any other question? Okay, uh, then let's move on to an uh, even more advanced layer, uh, which is the graph attention networks. Uh, so I, I actually put some uh, illustration here to see what is the difference between a graph attention network and a graph convolutional network. So in a graph convolutional network, the edge weights, the, the, for example, the the edge weights, say between node one and node two, is pre-calculated, right? Say you can do calculate the edge weight because you need this uh, edge weight to do the aggregation uh, of the messages. So you, you need to do uh, this. This is used in that ag aggregation, right? So by taking all the messages and then you you uh, multiply this with this weight and then you sum it up. So in the convolutional network, it's pre-calculated. Uh, and th th this is something that you can just define by like how you want to aggregate the messages. Well, in the attention network, the, the, the parameter is learned. So it, 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 it is learned by the node embedding derived, right? So then it can figure out, okay, 
out of the three neighbors of this one of node one, which node is more important to node one for this task? It could be that, the, for example, if the node three has a similar embedding with node one, maybe node three is more important, right? To transfer the label to, to of node three to, to node one, right? So this attention mechanism kind of actually train the node weight, uh, train the edge weight for the aggregation step. So it is definitely more powerful and flexible uh, in this. And in order to do this cool step, uh, it's, it's a very small change. So uh, you can just uh, import this, the, the graph attentional uh, network, convolutional network. So in, instead of the, so earlier on, the small changes here, instead of the GCN convolutional, you replace it with a GAT. So graph attention. So AT means attention here. Uh, and then you, you can just replace those two GCNs with the GAT. And then the input here, so this is still the same, right? But you can specify different hats. Uh, it means the different uh, attention. So in the attention, there's the multi-hat attention, which means that you can even learn different versions of the edge weights, right? So instead of just learning one version of the edge weights, you can learn eight different versions of the edge weight. So, so if you set the hat to be eight, and then the, the next output will be your output, from the these layers, and then you need to multiply it by eight since you have eight different versions of the output from the first layer. So that's your input dimension for the next layer. And then you can input later, like what's your number of classes over here. Uh, and then because that's the final output and don't want multi high level, and I set it to be one, and that is your final output. And you can choose the dropout here. So you can choose any ratio of dropout here within that convolutional layer. I think that's the only change. All the rest is the same. So you can still, uh, actually you can still add a dropout after value, but yeah, you can try that. And then this is uh, your attention layer over here. And then I even didn't rewrite the train because it's exactly the same train with the graph convolutional layer. So I, I just recall, still use the previous train function. And then you can write for again, 100 epochs. And yeah, and then you can see your test is again, further improved a little bit. It's not much, but but I think it's uh, it's uh, about two percent, around two percent improvement. Yeah. So I, I hope that through this tutorial, I hope that you get an idea of how to move on from uh, MLP, say a normal uh, or non-graph network to a graph convolutional network. And then how you can try out, you know, different type of type of the graph layers uh, in your network model. So I will again pause a little bit for you to play and also any questions you may have. I, I have a question about uh, the edge weight. I know in this data set, we don't have edge weight. Uh, do you see yeah. any, any uh, sample code using the edge weight? Uh, I don't, um, yeah, I haven't, uh, yeah, I don't know whether anyone use the edge properties. Edge analysis, I don't know whether they have anything like that. Hmm. Yeah, but I think it is worth looking at like uh, how they include the edge, the edge properties into this. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, maybe it also depends on how you actually code code up your model, right? So say if you have the edge 
edge properties, you can maybe combine the edge properties with the output of your node embeddings together. I mean, one, one straightforward way to do that. I didn't um, try PyTorch uh, before. I used another graph library called uh, Deep Graph Library, DGL. In yeah. that library, uh, I struggled a lot. I spent a lot of time finally figure out how they use the edge weight. Uh, I was curious uh, in PyTorch if they have an easier way to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'll look for uh, afterward. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, if you have any discoveries, feel free to comment it on that so we know. <laughs> sure, I will share. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? And I really hope you can just play with some dropout and also you can maybe even try say that's adding another layer help or sometimes it doesn't help <laughs> uh, there. And, uh, and also maybe you want to say after the convolutional layers, you want to, in order to get your final output, you may want to add some more dense layers uh, to say from the node embeddings to your final labels, you can in between, you can add more structures there to improve your classification task. So that's more, I think that will leave up to you to uh, modify on top of that. <laughs> 